Hello everyone, welcome to the second of the ASCOT webinar series. This one is um, new versions of ASCOT. I'm Anne-Marie Towers, I'm going to be speaking to you in a minute. But um, Ed, do you want to say anything about the technical? Yeah, hello everyone, um, welcome to this webinar. What I, we suggest that we do is if you've got any questions throughout the presentation, use the chat window to send them in. We'll then come to these at the end. Um, in turn, at the end you'll also have the chance to put your virtual hand up which means um, we'll unmute you individually. You can then ask your question so everyone can hear it. Um, the team will then answer. And if there's a follow-up question, ask away. Um, but for now, I'll hand over to Anne-Marie for the first presentation. Any technical issues during this, just use the chat window to contact us, and we'll reply individually. Um, but yeah, over to Anne-Marie. Thanks, Ed. Okay, so some of you may have already attended our last month's webinar, so you might have got the hang of this. Um, I'm going to go up first and speak to you about uh, a very new measure that we're piloting this year, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Stacey Rand, who's going to speak to you about our new carers measure, um, which will uh, be available on our website shortly, so that one is nearly ready for downloading and sharing. So... The first presentation um, is about a new version of ASCOT that we've developed and I've called the presentation Measuring the Outcomes of Care Homes, which reflects the new project title uh, in which this measure is being developed. So let me first of all acknowledge the project team. Uh, my colleague Nick Smith, who everyone probably knows already from previous ASCOT work, is a um, co-applicant on this project. And we've also got research assistant Sinead Ryder and Grace Collins and of course Professor Julia Border. So just to start with a broad overview, um, the project that we're uh, undertaking at the moment is funded by the NIHR School for Social Care Research, and there's a link there to the website for those of you who are interested in finding out more. The study started in May of this year, and it's a three-year project, so that will go until the end of April 2018. And actually, this, this project is actually a follow-up to a previous exploratory study that we undertook in 2013-2014 the paper from which um, has now been accepted by BMC Health Services Research. So this is in the submission process. Uh, eventually it will be open access, so, for those, so keep an eye out for it. I can't tell you when, of course, it will be publicly available, but it, is, uh, it has been accepted. So, um, so uh, a little bit of background to the study. Um, Back in sort of 20, 2012, 2013, we were approached by um, care home quality monitoring and improvement teams who were attending some of our ASCOT training courses. And what they told us is that they were moving to a less paper-based monitoring system for their quality monitoring audits that they do of care homes that they uh, commission services in. And they said that they were moving away from paper-based monitoring and having a greater focus on residents' lives, which meant that they wanted to introduce things like observation, interviews, take a more mixed methods approach to that monitoring process. And they were coming along and learning about the care homes toolkit in particular, but what they were saying in the feedback was that this is really good and we like the domains, but um, there's no way that we could do this level of data collection on individual residents for our purposes. Because obviously it's a very time consuming process collecting individual outcomes when the goal of your audit is to monitor the service, not measure the outcomes of individuals. So what they wanted was a home level version. They wanted to keep the domains, they wanted to preserve the focus on individual residents and outcome states, but they wanted to somehow conceptually change it and methodologically change it so that they could, they could rate a home rather than an individual resident. So in uh, our original feasibility study, our exploratory study, what we wanted to do was examine whether there was wider demand for this, because obviously we had some anecdotal evidence from our training courses, but we wanted to see if, this, if there was scope for this to go further. And we also wanted to do some conceptual developmental work, looking around the domains and the outcome states and see how, how easy it was going to be to do this adaptation. <laughs> So we did some desk-based activities back in 2013 um, using our own experiences and the feedback that we'd had from the quality monitoring teams that had attended the training. We rewrote some of the domains and the descriptions and we also edited the guidance 
um, and we revised the rating system. So we did a sort of initial desk-based activity uh, within the team. And then we carried out workshops and interviews and did some focus groups with members of the public. And this was part of a broad consultation exercise that took part early 2013, summer 2013. And some of you listening may have even been involved in those consultations. Um, the workshops were attended by professionals, so this was um, care providers, local authorities. We also did interviews with uh, people within CQC. Uh, a representative from Sky attended the workshop, uh, some people from Health Watch, um, and then, and that took part over interviews and, and a, a workshop in London, depending on how we could best engage with people. And then alongside that sort of uh, consultation phase with professional stakeholders, we wanted to include older people themselves and people who, if you like, represent members of the public. So um, some of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Chiquetta Williams and um, some of the team members that were working on the project, conducted focus groups with members of the public. We had 17 people take part in those three focus groups. And as I said, this included uh, a range range from around 45 in up to uh, late 80, so it included older people as well. Some of the people that were included, I think it was around 15 people, identified themselves as having experience already of helping someone choose a home. So often that was a relative, for example, it may have been they helped their own parent or parent-in-law choose a home. Uh, for some people it was their spouses. and. Um, I think 12 out of 17 it was that identified themselves as having previous or current caring responsibility. So this was a group of people who had some experience of social care in one guise or another and, and had some experience with care homes already. And what we wanted to do in this consultation and in these focus groups was to ask people, uh, present the measure broadly and the principles behind the measure and explore whether they felt there would be a demand for the measure, whether it would be useful for them for their own purposes and how they might see a measure like this being used. And if they saw it as helpful, what, the fe what features they would like to see included in the measure, or what issues they saw um, arising. And we took, that, we took the feedback from the consultation phase and fed that into further development of the draft measure. So a little overview of what the key messages were from, that, from those consultations. Um, it was really apparent early on that stakeholders had different priorities and that's not just a distinction between say the members of the public and uh, the professionals but even within the professionals for example there were distinctions and different priorities. The, the, it was clear straight away that the demand was from local authority quality improvement teams and that they could see this tool being used and rolled out within their local authorities. But there was also scope for the tool to be useful for providers who said, actually, this could be quite interesting from us from our own internal quality auditing purposes and could be a useful way of illustrating to the regulators, EQC, that we're committed to quality improvement, for example. But also researchers, because one of the problems that researchers sometimes have is um, wanting to get an overview of quality within services to complement, say, existing quality measures like the star ratings, for example, but not being able to... Um, have the budget to collect individual level data. So some researchers saw, saw that there might be a possibility for them using it as well in research, care home research. Interestingly, the focus groups demonstrated that the public, certainly our 17 focus group participants, said that they would be really interested in uh, seeing how well a care home was rated in the Ascot domains. Um, and that this kind of social care related quality of life or something that they would value information about and would find important and, rele and relevant. And actually, they spontaneously mentioned most of the Ascot domains when they talked about things they would like to know about care homes. But, and this was quite a big but, that actually for them to consider ratings at a home level valid and reliable, they would really want to know who was collecting the data, whether it was up to date, so that they could make their own decision around things like bias. So when we think about providers, for example, collecting this information then potentially making it available to prospective uh, users and their families, 
a little bit of caution there around the fact that actually family members did say, yes, this would be really interesting information, we would like it, but if the provider told us this information, we might view it with some scepticism. So, and I think this is where their knowledge of social care and their experience of choosing a home really came through in the message. People who hadn't necessarily had experience of choosing a home may not come up with the same issues. And we did try and recruit a focus group with people who had no experience of care homes or social care to see if this was the case. And actually what we found was we really struggled because um, most of the people that identified themselves as just members of the public, as soon as we started to talk to them, it became apparent they had some experience. So um, this, this is, I think, the, the, the situation that we're in now in the UK where actually most people, the, uh, middle age and upwards, are starting to have contact with social care in some guise or another. So actually it was quite a difficult group to recruit and we may have had to go quite young uh, in the population to to have recruited that group and we didn't have scope to recruit any more focus groups. But I think that is a an issue. Um, another key message that came out of the uh, both the consultations with professionals and the focus groups with the members of the public is that the ASCOT language needs to be simplified if it was going to be used for this purpose. So at the moment ASCOT is very much a research tool and um, although summaries might be handed out to uh, you know, people, service users and their families, we always change the language when it gets filtered down at that stage to members of the public. Whereas this was seen as more of a public facing toolkit uh, potentially. And that if it was going to be used for quality improvement and it, it was going to have to be accessible to care staff, um, family members, um, and that the language needs to be less abstract and also more focused on care home residents themselves. So this, this is a table that I hope is not too crammed in. I was trying to give you an overview. So I've started here with the first column with the Ascot domains. So this is the original Ascot domains as they stand now on our website. The second column is the name that we've given it at the home level and this reflects the feedback that we got from the consultation exercise. And then the third column I've called home level subtitle and that's because one of the things that came across quite strongly is that rather than just have one broad domain level title, so it'd be really useful to have a kind of broad brush title, which is the second column, followed by a brief description to give a person a little bit more information about what that domain is trying to capture. And because this is specifically about measuring quality in care homes, it is, it is more focused towards the language of residents and around care. So it's not like the rest of the ASCOP uh, toolkits, which go across social care services. This is very specific to care homes, this measure. So let's have a look at, for example, uh, the occupation domain. So that's the name that we give the domain in ASCOT occupation. And what we found was that people were confused about what that means. And obviously when you're talking about care homes, particularly older adult care homes, you're less likely to be talking about things like meaningful uh, paid employment, but you're talking more about meaningful activities. So being occupied rather than formal occupation. Whereas, of course, ASCOT, as it stands now, are the other measures, they go across social care and it was deliberately kept broad, that occupation domain, to include things like paid employment, voluntary work and other activities because it cuts across the whole of social care. So that's one of the key domains that's changed. So we've, for the home level we've gone for being occupied as the domain title and then we've given it a clarification in the subtitle, having things to do, being occupied. So you can see how we've tried to simplify some of the language there. We have also got domain definitions in exactly the same way that ASCOT does now. And again, here we focus the language on care home residents. And rather than it be focused on a specific individual like the main ASCOT measures are, we've tried to keep it um, more generic because we're trying to capture overall how people are overall in the home as a kind of broad brush view rather than an individual view. So residents are clean and comfortable, they're dressed in ways that meet their individual needs and wishes. And we can talk a little bit about what that means and how we conceptualise that in a moment when we look at the outcome states. Choice and control domain, residents have choice and control over their daily life, they feel they have a say in their care 
daily routine and activities and that their views are respected. So it's trying to, if you like, you know, put it in the language that residents and their family members might use. Now, anyone who's familiar with ASCOT will know that most of our measures have four outcome states, from the ideal state through to high needs. We wanted to, um, to keep, we wanted to preserve four outcome states in this, this, uh, this toolkit, but we needed to reconceptualize it. So rather than talking about outcome states for an individual person, we needed to think about what would be the overview at a home level. So what we've done here is we've conceptualized it in terms of personalization. So the best outcome state at the home level for each individual domain would be around the care being completely personalized for everybody in the home. Uh, and you can imagine in a small group home where there's three or four uh, younger adults, say, living in a home with intellectual disabilities, that actually you could really see this kind of personalization taking place now, whereas you could imagine this would be a lot harder in a large home and that you might find variation. So you might find some residents are having really personalized care and others not quite so much. So we've tried to reflect this variation in making the uh, ratings. So the top level, residents have outstanding quality of life in this area. All residents are being cared for and supported in a consistently personalized way with their wishes and feelings being taken into account versus the next level down, which is residents have good quality of life in this area and all residents are cared for and supported in a way that meets their needs. So it might not be quite at that level of personalization, their needs are being met, and you might say, well, that's the case for everyone, everyone's needs are being met, it's good, and some people are having their care really personalized, but not everyone. So that, that, that would get a domain, that would get the second rating down in that domain. So each of these ASCOT domains would be given a rating in exactly the same way that you would if you were a respondent in an interview or if you were using the care homes measure and you were making a, a third party rating. So every domain gets a rating. When we go down to the bottom two stage, which would be some and high needs in the other ASCOT toolkits, we've looked here for poor quality of life. So residents have an inadequate quality of life in this area. Some residents, so some residents, are not having their needs met, and there are enough issues to affect their quality of life. So if you went into a home and you could see variation in quality, so you were saying, well, okay, um, I can see that the most able, the people that can take care of themselves and they have, they need, they require the least help, for example, their needs are being met by the home, definitely. But I've looked at the, the I've also noticed that the people with, say, most advanced dementia, actually some of their needs are not being met in this domain. And in that case, you would mark down. So actually, you would say some, because some residents are not having their needs met, that would be the rating that the home would have to get. And then at the very bottom, we've got residents have a poor quality of life in this area. Residents' needs are not being met and their physical, psychological health is being put at risk because of so many issues or because the issues are so serious. So that would be the worst outcome. And actually, it would be quite extreme to see that in most homes. So we trained a, a quality monitoring team in one local authority to use these domain definitions and outcome states as part of their routine quality improvement processes. And they piloted it in two homes for older adults. Um, the homes were known to the teams, and so they were happy to take part. And we asked them afterwards to give us feedback, not only about their experience of using it for quality monitoring and improvement, but also how the homes found it very different kind of data collection to what they're used to. And certainly we found very early on that the data collection would need further streamlining. Um, we had included research interviews, observations, and the quality monitoring team said this is still too much. Even though it's better than collecting information at the individual level, there's still more than we can reasonably collect in the time available to us as part of a routine audit. Um, but one of the things that they were very positive about was the observation. They said it really added something to the kind of auditing that they normally do, which was traditionally very paper-based. Um, and they suggested that perhaps instead of having a kind of, you need to do this many interviews with staff, this many interviews with residents, that they actually focused more on broadening the observation out and then following up any issues that had arisen from the observation with questions and prompts. 
and that that would reduce the need to uh, collect uh, lots of additional data unnecessarily, but rather focus it on what they needed to find out. They found the domains and ratings were quite intuitive and actually worked well within their existing system. So that was good because that was something that we were unsure about having made sort of conceptual changes. Obviously this needs further testing, but the initial feedback was yes, it seemed to work. And quite interestingly uh, for us is that they, they worked in pairs and they said that when they came back together, that actually the two people that had been in the same home had largely rated the domains the same. So even though they may have picked up on slightly different things, they'd come to the same conclusions. That wasn't the case all the time. At certain times someone might have rated them second, someone rated them third outcome state, and they needed to discuss that and share that information. But actually, broadly, it was very good, and they were quite happy with their level of agreement. Obviously, we didn't do anything statistical with that because it was only a very small pilot to feed into the further development. So it was promising, but there were some improvements to be made. The home manager's feedback was that they found it, they found it quite helpful um, for the quality improvement teams to be focusing on practice and the lives of residents rather than just asking for more forms to be filled out. So they were quite pleased actually that the, the focus had slightly changed because I think at the time they were feeling like they were being asked to do a lot of paperwork for the commissioners, a lot of paperwork for CQC, a lot of paperwork for their own internal auditing. And so actually having a slight move away from paperwork was something that they found uh, they, were, they were in favour of. Um, and they also said that the process of, the obs of, of obs observing residents wasn't too onerous and they hadn't had negative feedback from care staff or residents about the presence of observers. So I think that was also something that we were quite pleased to hear because it was a concern that it may be um, a burden on the home. So really, at the end of that feasibility study, we came away sort of with the main message that we needed to do some further streamlining, that probably the best way of doing that would be to work with the local authority quality improvement team, uh, rather than try and do it ourselves, because it needs to fit with existing systems. So, and, and that it needed further testing um, and further work. So what we have started is a new project, so as I said at the start, this is this uh, measuring the outcomes of care homes, and we're working with East Sussex County Council, they're a partner in the research, and they're going to be helping us make further changes to the toolkits, and we will then be training their quality improvement team to use it in homes for older adults. We're starting with older adults initially because it's easier to start with one client group, get it working well there, and then roll it out to other client groups. We know that homes vary and we, that we, need to, we probably need to make adaptations for other client groups. So we're starting with older adults. That will include nursing and residential care. We're going to pilot the new measure, which we're calling CH4HL home level, in 30 homes for older adults. And we will also, alongside that, be collecting individual level data using the normal care homes toolkit. Hopefully we will recruit between 210 and 340 residents and so we'll have that individual level data that we will collect as the research team and then we will have the home level ratings that the local authority will be making about the homes that they're auditing. And we'll be able to compare the two and see where they differ, where we're picking from the same things. The main motivation for doing that is to explore at the home level are we missing something. So if, that, if the home comes out as good on the home level rating, but we're saying actually there's in, these issues around outcomes for individuals, then that's something we want to know about. How comparable are they? Or are they doing something quite different? It's not a problem if they're doing something different necessarily, but I think we need to be clear about that. And we're hoping that as CQC go in and uh, make their new inspection ratings, we'll be getting new star ratings on all the homes taking part in the study as well. So that will be something else that we'll be able to look at. How do the home level ratings as made by the ASCOT toolkit compare to those made by the regulator using the new star rating system? While we're in the homes, really, as value added, it gives us an opportunity to, to collect some additional data alongside. One of the things that we've wanted to do for a long time and uh, that my colleague Nick Smith is going to be leading on is that we want to have a look at how outcomes vary for care home residents out of office hours. Most of the research that we traditionally do, and I think this is probably true across care homes research, is done during what we would call classic office hours, Monday to Friday, pretty much nine till five or eight till six, 
very little research takes place on the evenings and weekends. And so one of the things that we've all long, long wanted to do is compare outcomes measured at those times, the outcomes that we're traditionally measuring during office hours. So this is going to be a really nice opportunity to do that. And Nick's going to be going in on the evenings and weekends and collecting that data so that we can make some comparisons. Another thing that those of you that have come to ASCOT training uh, will know about already is that we have plans um, to extend the CH3 toolkit to four levels to match all the other ASCOT toolkits. So uh, we have already got experienced CH3 raters, which is Nick and Sinead and I, um, and we've got a new member of the team, Grace Collins, who's going to be uh, trained up and using the toolkit. And they're going to be collecting data both at the three level, so making the kind of very broad brush individual level outcome ratings for high needs, some needs and no needs, which is what CH3 does at the moment. And then alongside that, where a resident at the individual level is marked at has it having no needs using the CH3 toolkit, the raters, so this will be Grace, Nick, Sinead and I, will sit down and say, okay, we know that using CH3 they've got no needs. Can we extend this? Can we make the CH4? If using the, to match the other toolkits, would they have an ideal app? Is it ideal or is it just no needs, sort of mustn't grumble? So we're going to pilot whether we can extend it to that four, fourth level using this mixed methods approach. And in all honesty, we think that we can do it, but we're not sure, and we're not sure we can do it reliably. So this will be a really good opportunity to do that. We know from our previous research that the ratings at the three levels are reliable. We have excellent and good inter-rater reliability scores. So whether or not we can extend it to four levels, and in which case it will be really handy, because if it's successful, it will mean that there'll be read across, uh, or certainly better read across, between the care homes measure and the other ASCOT toolkits. Finally, in addition to all of that, we will, alongside the data on residents, try and recruit some relatives of those residents who are living in care homes, if they identify themselves as informal carers. We know that a lot of the time, the reason that people move into care homes is because of a breakdown in the informal carer relationship, and that the informal carer can't cope anymore, and that, the, that this precipitates a person moving into a home. So. What we would like to do is measure the outcomes now for the carer, now that the person is living, their relative is living in a care home, and try and see where the carer is gaining and where the carer maybe is losing out because maybe they've got feelings of guilt, for example. So we're going to be trying to recruit some relatives alongside. And we know that this is a hard to, hard to recruit group, so um, we don't know exactly what kind of numbers we're going to get there, but, but we're certainly going to be inviting uh, relatives to take part in some interviews there. And to do that, we're going to be using the new ASCOT Care measure, uh, which Stacey is going to be talking about next. So I'm not going to say too much about that care measure now because Stacey's going to be doing a presentation on that next. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, and just to put this disclaimer up saying that everything that I've talked about now is the views of us as a research team, not the views of the Fungible Department of Health. And if anybody has any burning questions about this home level measure, then they can ask it now and I'll hand over to Ed. Otherwise, we'll go straight on to the care measure and we can take more questions at the end. The only point that's come up during this, a few people have said, will we make a recording or slides of this available later? Um, we will. For various reasons, we're not exactly sure when this will happen, um, but ASAP um, we'll have a recording online alongside the recording of the last webinar from last month. Um, if anyone has a question for Anne-Marie now, please raise your virtual hand by clicking the little hand button. Um, no? In that case, over to Stacey. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, as was just um, being said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a new um, ASCOP instrument which is designed for informal carers. Sorry, everyone can just do that. And yeah. then, yeah, over to you. Okay, thank you. 
So there were um, two versions of this new um, ASCOT carer toolkit. Um, when we're talking about carers in this context, we're talking about informal carers. That's people who care unpaid for a family member or friend due to illness, disability or long-term health condition. And the two new versions of ASCOT for carers, we've got a self-completion version, which is used to look at the social care related quality of life of carers. And that might be carers who use social care for themselves as carers. So that might be things like carer organisations or training for carers. Or they might be, um, in a way, using social care via the person they look after. So the person that they care for might be having home care or receive equipment services. Um, so this self-completion version and the interview version, in fact, are targeted at that group. The interview version um, is very similar to the self-completion version, but it does something a little bit different. What it offers is um, it uses a method that was developed in the main ASCOT tool, which is a counterfactual self-estimation method, and that allows um, a measurement of the effect of social care support on carers' quality of life. And I'll be coming back and talking about the interview version in particular in more detail later in the presentation. But first of all, I just wanted to give a little bit of context about the development of the tool. As Anne-Marie mentioned, we're about to launch the tool on our website, so it will be available to download. Um, but the instrument is very much um, been in development for a number of years in three main phases of work. The first main phase um, of work was in the development of a local survey for carers in Kent. This work involved six focus groups, four of which were with carers and two with care managers. And the aim of this work was to identify areas of quality of life relevant to carers. As part of the work, a series of questions were developed and refined in 56 one-to-one -one interviews. And the final survey included various questions, not just looking at quality of life, but also looking at experiences and circumstances of carers. Some of the questions from this survey were then included in the second phase of work, which was further survey development and a pilot survey of adult carers across England. This took place in 2009-2010. The data collected in the pilot was analysed by colleagues and from this they identified six or seven quality of life questions that have now fed into the um, survey that takes place nationally run by local authorities every two years. Moving on, we've had more recently a third stage of work um, which I and colleagues have been involved in. It started back in 2012 with the first stage of work. Um, this aimed to take the version from the um, survey of adult carers in England, which has three levels of response to each question, and to see whether we could adapt that to include four levels. So as Anne-Marie was saying, um, with the carer version as well, we only had three levels because there wasn't a difference between the ideal state and no needs. So what we tried to do was to break those two levels into two separate response options in order that it had greater comparability with the main ASCOT tool. And the other thing that we aimed to do was to take the current questions which were um, self-completion and see if we could develop an interview version with what we call expected questions. These questions ask carers to imagine an expected situation where they didn't have social care support. And this very much taps into this method I was talking about, this counterfactual self-estimation method. So the survey that was developed in that first phase was then used in a study um, which ran between 2013 and 2014. This study we surveyed 387 carers across 22 local authorities in England. Um, by face-to-face -face or telephone interview. And the data we collected from that has been used to look at the construct validity and factor structure of the ASCOT carer measure. And this is reported in um, a paper that's just been published online recently. So I, before kind of moving on and looking more specifically at the interview version, I just wanted to focus in on the different aspects of quality of life captured by both the self-completion and interview versions and compare those to the main version of ASCOT for service users. 
You can see in this table that the first three domains, so control over daily life, occupation and social participation, that both versions, both service user and carer versions, include questions to capture these domains. But from the work that I just described across the three phases, it was found that carers had different needs and different concerns. And this is where the two versions um, depart from one another. So for personal safety, for example, it was found that the wording of the question um, needed to be adapted so that it really focused in on carer-specific needs, so looking at accidents or harm that might arise from the caring role. Instead of questions about personal cleanliness and comfort or food and drink, we developed a domain which is about self-care, which is a broad domain that looks at carers' abilities to make sure they're eating well or getting enough sleep. And then there were two carer-specific domains that have no correlates in the um, service user version. We've got time and space to be yourself, um, which is about the carer's ability to mentally switch off from being a carer to have some psychological space, and also feeling supported and encouraged in the caring role. And as I said, both the self-completion and interview version includes the um, seven carer domains with one question for each of those domains. But now I'd like to focus in a little bit on the interview version and what this offers um, alongside the self-completion version. A key issue in interpreting and using quality of life is that of attribution. An individual's rating of quality of life can be influenced by a number of different factors. Some of these factors may be related to social care support, whereas others might be unrelated. So a key question is how can we look at the impact of social care, how can we measure that to the exclusion of other factors that might be unrelated to social care. So there are various methods and the kind of gold standard methodology is that of randomised control trials. And what these aim to do is to control for factors experimentally so that the, they can estimate the effect of an intervention. However, randomised control trials are not always possible due to constraints on time and resources. So a pragmatic alternative is to ask respondents directly about how an intervention, social care intervention, affects their quality of life. And this uses, as I mentioned before, this counterfactual self-estimation method. That is, in this example, you actually ask carers to imagine a situation where they no longer had social, have social care support, an imaginary situation, and to then rate their quality of life and we call this the expected quality of life. And the answers to these questions allows the calculation of what we call gain, or the effect of services, as the difference between their current quality of life at the moment and expected quality of life. So the ASCOP carer interview, um, what it looks like is we've got a series of different questions. We've got a section with some instructions for the interviewers, um, because of the complexity of this particular tool, we would recommend that this is always conducted as an interview rather than a self-completion version. We then have an introduction that's used by the interviewer with the respondent to set the um, questionnaire, the interview up. And there follows 21 questions which cover the seven domains of quality of life, with three questions for each domain. And each one follows the same pattern, it asks the carer about their current quality of life, as it is at the moment. There's a question that asks whether services affect that particular aspect of quality of life. And if the carer answers yes or don't know, then they go on to ask um, a question about their expected quality of life in that domain. So the interviewer instructions in the question there cover, cover various points. However, in the testing and development of the questionnaire, it was found that it's really important to have a clear definition of social care support when you're using this method. For example, if the aim of a study in which is using this tool is to look at the effect of short-term breaks, then the questionnaire um, guides the interviewer to adapt the wording of the questions so that the questions ask about short-term breaks. And likewise, if the study is interested in the impact of um, carer support groups, then the questions are adapted to ask about carer support groups. 
So here is an example of one of the questions. Um, this is about occupation, which is about doing things that you value and enjoy. And we've got the three questions that I've just mentioned. The top one, the current question. Um, question two is the filter question. And question three is the expected question. So just to kind of go through to give you an idea of what the questionnaire is like. The current question, which of the following statements best describes how you spend your time? When you're thinking about how you spend your time, please include anything you value or enjoy, including leisure activities, formal employment, voluntary or unpaid work and caring for others. And the carer is then given the four response options to pick from the top response option which is the ideal state so that all of their needs are being met into their preferred level through to the bottom option which um, indicates that they have high needs. The filter question you can see that some of the text is in green and this is where as I mentioned the interviewer has to adapt the wording um, to suit the particular context in which they're asking the questions and the example I've given here the interviewer is asking about a carer service and that carer service is a carer support group. So in that case, the question is, do the support and services you get from the carer support group affect how you spend your time doing things you value and enjoy? But in testing, we found that you can actually use the same method in the same question in a slightly different way. So you might be interested in the impact of a service for the person the carer is looking after or the carer's outcome. So it might be um, home care, for example, and in which case then those words in green you would cha um, change, so do the support and services that, and insert the name of the person who's being looked after, um, and so on. Finally, you have the expected situation, and again, the words in green are adapted around the context, and this asks the carer to imagine a situation without support and services, and asks them to rate their quality of life in that situation using the same four levels of responses for the current question. So once the questionnaire has been completed, um, in terms of scoring, each of the current scores is given, um, each of the current questions is given a score from three for the ideal state through to zero for high level needs. And the overall score for the ASCOT carer is simply the sum of the seven domains. So you end up with a score from zero, which is the lowest quality of life, through to 21 for the highest quality of life. The interview version also allows you to calculate the overall expected score, so what quality of life would be like in a situation where the carer didn't have services. And this follows exactly the same pattern with one exception. <coughs> Excuse me. It may be that the carer says for some of the domains that services don't have an effect and in that case they might not have been asked the expected question. So in that case where the expected question hasn't been asked you simply take the score for the current quality of life and apply that to the expected situation. You sum it up and again you get a score from 0 through to 21. The gain or effect of services is simply the difference between the current and expected overall quality of life schools. And this gives you an idea of the impact of services on a carer's quality of life. So this is to give you an example using the data from the study that I mentioned earlier, um, where we interviewed 387 carers. And the diagram shows um, each of the seven domains of carer, social care related quality of life. Um, the blue dots and blue lines show the average quality of life in the current situation for each of the domains. And the red dots and red lines show the average expected quality of life in each of the domains. And as you'd expect, the um, current quality of life is higher than the expected. So that's showing that on average, um, services are having an impact on quality of life. And this varies slightly across the different domains. Looking at the data in a different way, um, this shows the gain scores across the sample. So this is the score of the effective services. And what we found was that three quarters of the sample reported that they had um, that services had a posit positive effect on their quality of life. 
In this particular sample, we had 22% saying that there was no effective services at all. And that does seem rather high, um, although this may be because of the nature of the sample. So in this particular study, um, how we recruited carers was we um, found people who were using publicly funded social care services recruited through local authorities. The carers were recruited via these people. Um, so not all of the carers in the sample were known to local authorities. They came from a whole range of different circumstances. They could maybe be doing only a couple of hours care a week through to um, practically being full-time carers. They may be receiving services themselves or not. So that may be explaining why um, we've got 22% reporting no effect. We actually had a very small number, nine, um, saying that services actually had a negative effect on um, their quality of life, um, which again was quite surprising. Um, and unfortunately, because the way the interviews were conducted, we don't, we're not able to dig into these particular cases. Although it might be helpful to go back and um, think about the earlier development work that I mentioned. When we were testing these questions, there were a couple of cases where people actually reported negative um, effects on quality of life. And to give an example, so you get a little bit of a flavour of what might be going on here, um, in one of the interviews, the carer said that um, services had a negative um, impact on her ability to of self-care. And the reason she gave was that the person she looked after received home care services. Um, but the carers came in first thing in the morning and were in a rush. And um, what they did was, when they were there, they took up her time, they were talking to her. And when they left, they left things in a mess and she needed to clear up. And she said, actually, by them coming in, she found that she had less time to have a shower and look after herself in the morning to get breakfast and so on. So that, that might be, as an example, giving a little bit of insight as to why we're seeing a negative effect. So in, in terms of the presentation, as I said before, we've now got two versions. We've got the self-completion and the interview version. They're going to shortly be available on our website. And they are already available if you contact us um, on an ad hoc basis. Um, in terms of next steps, um, we've got a couple of projects that are going to be um, looking at some things using the carer tool. Um, we've got one project that's going to be looking at translating um, the carer tools into um, other languages and also developing preference weights um, as we have preference weights for the main version of ASCOT. And we're also planning some other work which will be looking at how to use ASCOT Care Best alongside the main version of ASCOT. Um, really as a way of looking into um, measuring the wider impact of social care. So how social care not only affects an individual who's receiving um, social care services, but also their informal carer. And um, this is just some um, acknowledgements and a disclaimer um, for this particular work. Thank you. So if there are any questions, I'm going to pass over to Ed. Thank you, Stacey. Um, anyone with a question, once again, raise your hand now. Looks like everything's been covered. Yeah, just I suppose I would just say um, if you if you have if you're a bit apprehensive about raising your hand now, then you can always email uh, the Ascot website if you have a follow-up question that you would like to ask. Or I would encourage you to use our Ascot forum yes. and post a comment on there, and then we can reply, and everyone else will benefit from seeing the answer as well. So um, thank you all for listening. Oh, hang on, we've oh. just had a question come in um, from Anna. What might be the impact of the Care Act on the future use of the Care Act all? Ooh. 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 Lots of researchers rolling their chins here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's best to answer that. Yeah, Stacey? Well, it's, it's Stacey. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good um, question. Um, I don't think we can kind of say for definite yet, but there's certainly, with the Care Act, um, increased focus on carers' outcomes and um, hopefully would see that there is interest in the ASCOT carer tool mm -hmm. and sort of focusing in on that. I know with the main um, version of ASCOT there have been cases where it's been used in um, looking at assessments and reviews and it would be interesting to see if similar developments also happen mm -hmm. um, on the carer side as well. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that 
uh, just to chip in, one of the things that we're exploring more and more with uh, providers is the fact that actually as a provider organisation, regardless of whether your focus is on, if you like, the care for, in some ways you may, you may benefit from also measuring your impact on the informal carer if you're trying to demonstrate your worth to both commissioners and also the regulator because I think that actually inadvertently there is a case as Stacey said that actually services for the cared for can inadvertently have a really good impact on the uh, informal carer's quality of life actually even if that's not what they're designed for so I think that the care act might help people focus on on looking at that yeah Hannah I hope that answers your question um no hands up and no questions coming in. Oh, yeah, Anna, pleasure. <laughs> um, if that's it, then, thank you all very much for attending. Um, we'd be very interested to get your feedback on, as Adam Marie said, the content of the presentations and any other questions, um, as well as what people think of using um, webinars like this to deliver presentations. It's something we're trying to use a lot more of here, so we'd be interested in feedback, um, how you think it works, any suggestions from improvement, um, anything like that. If that's it, and I can see no more questions, yes, the slides will be available as we're recording of this webinar, but we can't be too sure of when that will be. No, um, waiting for permission from funders. Yeah, we have um, all your email addresses from when you registered on this, and we'll circulate the link as soon as we can. Um, so thank you all very much for attending. Have a nice rest of your Mondays. Thanks, Ed.